At the moment, we don't fire much. There's a shortage of ammunition. Ukrainians are losing their lives. Ukrainians are fighting also for our freedom. We need ammunition. We need more manpower. We need weapons. We have proposed to guarantee stable and substantial financing to Ukraine. If we don't get it now, we won't move anywhere. The United States has been by far the biggest supplier of weapons to Ukraine. Germany is the second biggest supplier, providing battle tanks and air defense systems. But for Germany's opposition political party, the Christian Democrats, the country is not doing enough. Today in Germany's parliament, a motion on sending Taurus missiles to Ukraine fell. Now, the Taurus cruise missile has a longer range than other missiles available to Ukraine. It would allow Ukraine to hit targets across occupied Crimea, including the Kesh Bridge, which connects Crimea to Russia. I want to bring in now our political correspondent, Simon Young. He's here in Berlin. Good to see you, Simon. What's behind the, the opposition, these Christian Democrats, staging this vote on sending tourist missiles to Ukraine? Well, Brent, I think there are a lot of politicians here in Berlin who are concerned uh, that uh, the West, and Germany included, is perhaps not doing enough to uh, support Ukraine. The CDU leader, Friedrich Merz, has uh, emphasized that, uh, that there's a sort of stalemate uh, on the ground in Ukraine uh, at the moment in this war. And uh, he says that's why he's brought forward this uh, motion in Parliament today um, to sort of force the government's hand uh, and, uh, you know, get them to provide more. Uh, and uh, they think that uh, this could really make the key difference in trying to push back uh, Russian forces in Ukraine, this uh, Taurus weapon that's got a range of 500 uh, kilometers uh, and could really help to sort of take out uh, things like munition uh, bases and, uh, you know, attack the supply line. So they think it could make a huge difference. Uh, and that's uh, the reason to push the government. Of course, there's also a political motive. It's clear uh, the government is somewhat split on this. Chancellor Schultz himself is hesitant to deliver it, Taurus, uh, and some prominent figures within the government uh, parties have, are on record as saying they mm. think it would be a good idea. So I think uh, it's the opposition sort of attacking that uh, political vulnerability as well. And so in this case, does no really mean no? Does the fact that Parliament voted against sending these missiles, does it mean that they will not be sent? Uh, well, not uh, perhaps in the long term, uh, uh, you, despite the fact that Chancellor Schultz said uh, fairly clearly back in October of last year that he was against uh, sending these things. The government does say that uh, it is looking daily at everything it can do to help Ukraine uh, win this war and not lose it. Uh, and, uh, and the concern, by the way, uh, with Taurus is that uh, Ukraine might use these weapons to strike at Russian territory directly, uh, and that could lead to an escalation in the war. Kiev says it won't do that. But uh, uh, as I say, the government's, you know, looking at ways to help Ukraine uh, and they're also making demands uh, on other countries. They're saying, let's buy more, let's produce more weapons. Mm. Uh, there are countries out there around the world who've got stocks of some key weapons that Ukraine could use. Why not buy those up and provide those? And some are saying, well, you know, it's not just Taurus. There are many other kinds of things that Ukraine needs. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, we remember Germany would not send tanks to Ukraine until the U.S. agreed that it would do that. And now we have Chancellor Schultz saying that any delivery of tourist missiles would depend on the United States. I mean, how do you explain this level of, you know, caution? You first, then us. Yeah, well, I think, uh, of course, Germany uh, does tie its position to uh, the U.S. position uh, in uh, particularly in sort of geostrategic military uh, affairs. Uh, and, uh, you know, Berlin knows that uh, that uh, it's the economic and military might of the U.S. that's really the backbone uh, of uh, of the Western alliance. So keeping in step with Washington uh, is important. I think for Germany also it's been important uh, not to be... Uh, 
you know, splittable away from the pack. Putin might uh, seize on any, uh, you know, a, 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 any um, unique um, actions by Germany to say, you know, they're going further and they're becoming a party to this war uh, and that could escalate things in Europe uh, independently from the US. So I think it's important for Germany to keep in step with Washington. At the same time, it's not only about that. Chancellor Schultz is pressing other European nations to provide more help mm. to Ukraine as well. DW Simon Young with the latest tonight here in Berlin. As always, Simon, thank you. And for more, I want to bring in military analyst Marina Miron now from King's College London. Marina, it's good to see you. Ukraine's foreign minister says that the priority this year for the country is to gain control of the skies. Now, is that feasible? And would it make a difference for a city like Kharkiv, which is so close to the Russian border? Good evening. Well, we have to deconstruct what um, Kuleba is saying, because uh, Ukraine uh, being able to control its skies is a very complicated matter. And um, what it means is that Ukraine at least wants air superiority, meaning being able to operate in the sky without any prohibitive action by the Russians. And that would entail um, two types of operations, um, defensive counter-air operations and offensive counter-air operations, meaning that the Ukrainians would need to have enough aircraft to engage the Russian aircraft, and they would have to, uh, to have a network of uh, ground-based air defense systems. So I'm not sure how it is envisaged that Ukraine is going to achieve that, knowing that the delivery of F-16s has been delayed and that there is a shortage of air defense. Of course, it would make a certain difference denying the Russians um, free operability in the airspace, um, even for bordering cities but I don't think that Ukraine can achieve that. Yeah, Foreign Minister Kaleba was at the World Economic Forum earlier today talking. He described 2022 as the year Ukraine defeated Russia on land. He said last year was the year that Ukraine defeated Russia at sea. We'd expect, you would think, an upbeat assessment from Ukraine, but doesn't the rhetoric mask a conflict that, and I'm using Zelensky's word here, that has become frozen? Well, I think to a certain extent we have to separate the uh, statements that politicians make from what is actually happening. And we have to bear in mind the aim of uh, Kuleba's statement in Davos and also Zelensky's statements, because they are there to garner support from the West. It doesn't have to coincide with the reality on the battlefield. And I think right now the Ukrainian armed forces are in a great difficulty containing the, the ongoing Russian pushes combined with the Russian air campaign at the moment. So I, I don't think that the conflict is frozen. And I think it, it, it is a um, political statement in order to get more weapons and to show that Ukraine is still willing to fight and to push the Russians back. Yeah, to get more weapons. I mean, you've been telling us, we've heard this from other military analysts now for almost two years, that no weapons system on its own will be a game changer. So will further deliveries of Western weapons, will they change the situation on the ground? Well, um, indeed, um, we cannot say that a specific weapon is a game changer and um, giving Ukraine's needs, it needs quite a lot of different sorts of weapons from howitzers to tanks to aircraft to air defense systems, ammunition, um, EW, electromagnetic warfare equipment. So it's a full spectrum of what the Ukrainian armed forces would need. And I do not think that there is a, the capability to deliver those weapons. And whatever Ukraine is going to get, again, um, I don't think that it will be a major shift. Yes, it will help Ukraine uh, with its long range capabilities, for instance, but I don't think that it will be changing the situation dramatically unless Ukraine gets all of uh, what I have just named. Mm -hmm. Yeah, consider the, the debate here in Germany um, about sending in tourists, the tourist debate, as they, they're calling it. Zelensky's analysis here is that the fear of sending weapons to Ukraine, the fear of provoking Russia with those weapons enabled this war in the first place. Do you agree? 
Well, I, I, with all due respect to uh, Mr. Zelensky, I would have to disagree because if we look back at the origins of this war, it started well before February 22. It's been going on since 2014 overtly with uh, formations in the Donbass fighting the Ukrainian armed forces. And I think during that time, it was a time when the Western countries could have potentially changed the situation and could have stepped in, but it has been largely ignored. And uh, Ukraine was encouraged to enact all sorts of reforms to join NATO, which aggravated um, Russia's behavior until what we have seen the full scale invasion of uh, February 2022. Therefore, I think uh, that um, the weapons or not sending specific types of weapons is not the real reason. Mm -hmm. Let me just um, get your take on this before we run out of time. Now, with the possibility of Donald Trump becoming U.S. president yet again, um, we're, we're seeing signs that countries are hedging against that and withholding weapons, which they feel that they might need to defend themselves against a further emboldened Russia, that you know, Ukraine may be the beginning, not the end of this. What's your take? Well, I, I think the fears of uh, Russia actually attacking a NATO country are overstated. I don't think that Russia is going to use its military force to attack the Baltics, for instance, because Russia understands that it doesn't have the capability to do so. What I think um, the problem is, is that Russia will not necessarily limit itself to Ukraine and not necessarily use military means. For instance, uh, Russia is about to sign a, a military cooperation pact with Iran. So Russia can influence um, politics in other regions of the world, which are important to Western countries, including the United States. And I think that is the real danger here, as well as Russia's ongoing um, informational warfare. Military analyst Marina Marone from King's College. As always, Marina, we appreciate your time and your analysis. Thank you. Thank you for having me.